Dolly was born in 1946 as Dolly Rebecca Parton. She was the fourth born child to Robert Lee Parton Sr. and A.B. Lee, I hope I'm saying that right, A.B. Lee Caroline. Dolly's parents were actually so poor that when Dolly was born, they literally paid the midwife in the form of cornmeal. Her father was a farmer who was one of 13 children. He was basically raised in the mountains of Tennessee. If you haven't seen my video about the real Johnny from The Devil Went Down to Georgia, the song The Devil Went Down to Georgia was actually about a real fiddling contest and it was about a real man named Low Stokes who played the fiddle, never had a fiddle lesson in his life, came down from the mountains and just destroyed these fiddling contests. If you haven't seen that video, I'm gonna link it here, but every time I hear the mountains of Tennessee or the mountains of Georgia, I think of The Devil Went Down to Georgia and the real Johnny, the, the real Low Stokes. And that's a good story. That's like, it has kind of a crazy twist to it when Low Stokes, well, I won't spoil it, but just go ahead, go ahead and watch that one if you wanted a little encore after this. So Lee Dolly's father was probably growing up very similar to Low Stokes is my point. He was growing up in the mountains of Tennessee in an impoverished family, one of 13. He was working on a farm. Now her father never actually learned to read or write, but Dolly says that he had the most business sense out of anyone she's ever met. It must have been really hard uh, for you, Daddy, working in the fields. I remember most of my life, I remember seeing you down here in these fields and other fields and places where we lived, but you never did seem to complain or gripe about it. Only thing I ever gripped on you about when we was uh, thinning the corn out, there'd be three stalks in the hill and we'd pull a little stalk out, and I noticed you were pulling the big stalks out. <laughs> I said, Dolly, don't do that. And she'll say that to this day, that her father was blessed with the best business sense. I got my business sense from my dad. I think I got that strength, you know, from him. Since her father had farmed his whole life, he knew the ins and outs of the farming industry. He didn't need to go to school. He didn't need to be literate to understand what it took to run a good farm. Now, for several years and for the first few years of Dolly's life, the crops that her father was reaping from the farm that Dolly and her siblings lived on served as payment as rent to the house that they were living in. So if there was a season though where there wasn't a lot of rain and they didn't have that great of a harvest, her father literally couldn't pay the rent for the house that they were living in. A few years after Dolly was born, her father realized renting out a farmhouse was not a sustainable way to live with a family, with a wife, and with kids. So by 1951, when Dolly was about five years old, Lee, her father, decided to finally acquire his own land. This land was in Sevier County, Tennessee. Here, he would continue farming, primarily tobacco crops and raising livestock. But the most important thing about Dolly's family purchasing this land was that they were not dependent on the season to pay their rent. With this new purchase of land, Dolly's father also knew farming alone was not a sustainable way to survive. So he started taking up construction jobs on the side. Just in case there was a bad month or a bad week and they lost a lot of crops, he knew that he had a backup plan and he had some backup money coming in. Now, while her father was out being a businessman and a farmer and a construction worker and doing everything he could to bring in all of the money that he could, Dolly's mother, meanwhile, was at home taking care of the kids, taking care of the house, and continuing to have children, might I say. It was hard times back here. I was 16 years old, had one baby already, and, and uh, pregnant with another baby, and he had to go off to work on Sunday evening and come back on Friday. I was here with the Whippoorwills and the kids. Dolly's mother, Avi, birthed 12 children by the time she was 35. It's a lot of work. Of course, having that many children in that short of a time frame did a lot to her mother's body, but her mom also struggled from a couple of other health problems as well. But despite all of her mother's health problems, she made sure that there was always happiness and music in the Parton household. Dolly's grandfather was actually a fiddler himself, so they grew up surrounded by fiddle music. Again, totally reminds me of Low Stokes and the Devil Went Down to Georgia. Dolly's mother also made sure that all of the children had a chance to sing in the local church. Although I'm kind of painting a picture of the house being super happy and full of music and full of dancing and full of fiddling, things were really tough for the Parton family. In fact, the house that they lived in on the land that they owned was a one bedroom house. A one bedroom house for 12 children and two adults. It was a little tight. Because of this, there would be multiple children in a bed at any given point in time, and they all had to sleep together. Dolly was quoted in Playboy in 1978, the kids peed on me every night. We slept three and four in the bed. I would wash every night, and as soon as I go to bed, the kids would wet on me again, and I'd have to get up in the morning and do the same thing. <laughs> she said it was actually kind of nice when it was really cold out that the kids would pee on you. But in between these 
little hardships, Dolly would perform for her family. At one point, she learned how to put a tin can over a stick to make it look like a microphone, and she would just give shows to her family out on their front porch. She also remembers singing to the chickens and to the dogs and to the livestock on the farm, kind of like Carrie Underwood when she auditioned for American Idol and she's like singing to the livestock. And when she was only seven years old, Dolly remembers making her very first guitar out of an old mandolin and two bass guitar strings. Now, also super common with big families on farms was the concept that the older children would help out with the younger children. In Dolly's family, she was the fourth of 12. Once she got to be about nine years old, her mother assigned her a baby. And this was kind of common if the mother had older children and then was giving birth to new children, she would assign one of the older children on the farm to kind of be a mother's helper and help change the baby and make sure the baby is fed. And if the mother is busy doing something else, then that's your baby. You're responsible for watching that baby, for caring for that baby. And when Dolly was nine, she was given a baby to take care of. It was a little boy and his name was Larry. Tragically, when Larry was still in his newborn phase, Larry passed away. But it was a big, it was a really hard thing for me as, as for all of us. And it was hard for daddy too, but mama and I had the hardest time with it because it was supposed to be my baby. And, yeah. and mama, of course, just losing a child at all. And just being, Lord only knows, she never had vitamins. She never had, you know, six of us were born at home. Not even a full year after Larry's tragic death, a remarkable opportunity came Dolly's way. Her uncle, who was her mother's brother, he actually ended up knowing somebody who worked at a radio program that was called Cass Walker Farm. Dolly's uncle ended up convincing his friend who ran this radio show to play Dolly singing on his show. Before Dolly even knew it, she was singing on the radio program. Everybody in the local area started to recognize Dolly's voice and think she was just the cutest little girl singing on the radio that they ever heard. Now, about three years into singing on this radio show, the radio company and her uncle, Bill Owens, assisted Dolly in making her very first official recording. The first recording was called Puppy Love. It was made in 1959. Now, this was Dolly's first official single, even though it never charted. And Dolly was only about 12 or 13 years old when this happened. When Dolly was 13, she got another big break. The Johnny Cash show that was performing at the Ryman Auditorium wanted to have Dolly sing on stage at the Grand Ole Opry. If you haven't seen my video about the love story of Johnny and June, by the way, and how they met backstage at the Ryman, I'll link it right here. And Dolly actually jokes that she had a huge crush on Johnny Cash, which is hilarious to me because she was 13 and he was for sure an adult. <laughs> there was a man there at the same time named Porter Wagner. Porter had been to the Opry multiple times before. He had a connection to a man named Carl Smith. And again, if you watch the Johnny Cash video, you'll see that June Carter was actually married to Carl Smith and pregnant with her first baby with Carl Smith when she met Johnny backstage at the Ryman and they fell in love. I love music and I love the music industry, but all of these affairs really kind of rubbed me the wrong way, but you know what, it is what it is, and that's what happened. And Carl Smith, though, um, Porter Wagner had written several songs for Carl Smith. So I think we've got some real fine songs and tunes and a lot of things lined up for you today. Right now it's time to meet our special guest, a guy that it's always a lot of fun to be around, and he's one of the finest, biggest stars in country music. Let's welcome our good buddy, Mr. Carl Smith. So Porter knew Carl and Carl was connected to the Grand Ole Opry and to the Johnny Cash show. And ultimately that is how Dolly and Porter met. Dolly Parton could probably be compared to the Shirley Temple of her time. And everyone just thought she was adorable and just the cutest little Southern belle. After her show at the Grand Ole Opry, she received not one, not two, but three encores from the crowd. Dolly at this time was 13, Porter was 32. Now, despite her music career taking off at the age of 13, Dolly was determined to get her education and she did make a point to finish high school. Now, when she was gonna be moving to college though, that's when she decided to move to Nashville, Tennessee to pursue music. This would have been around 1962. So just a couple of years after her debut at the Grand Ole Opry, Dolly was now 16 and she moved to Nashville with her uncle, the uncle who had originally gotten her on the radio show. Her uncle helped her get signed with her very first publishing company, Tree Publishing and Mercury Records, where she recorded a few more singles that also unfortunately failed to chart. 
After less than a year with Tree Publishing and Mercury, they actually got dropped from their contract because she wasn't charting. By 1963, however, Dolly had found a new home at Somerset Records. Somerset was familiar with Dolly's sound. In 1963, Dolly released a compilation album with Faye Tucker that actually did quite well. Even though this compilation album was getting a little bit of traction, Dolly was still on the market for an independent label. It took a few years, but in 1965, Monument Records decided to sign Dolly Parton and her uncle as an independent artist. This was everything that Dolly had been hoping for. Around the same time that Dolly got signed as an independent artist, she was standing outside the wishy-washy laundromat in Nashville, Tennessee, when a 21-year-old drove by in a pickup truck and a hollered at her. That man's name was Carl Dean. They exchanged information. Officially, that was their first official date. Carl also said that as soon as he met Dolly, he knew that she was the one and he couldn't take his eyes off of her. He actually says that after that first date on the front porch, he drove Dolly to meet his mother and his father almost right away because he knew that she was the one. While Dolly's love life was taking off with Carl Dean, her music career was also taking off as an independent artist. Through Monument, she ends up having two really good singles that charted on the Billboard country charts. Those were called Dumb Blonde, which charted number 24, and Something Fishy, which charted number 17 in 1967. One year after Dolly's two singles chart for the first time, she and Carl Dean got married. By the ripe age of 21, Dolly had released her first full album called Hello, I'm Dolly, and this album was also through Monument Records. It was in September of the same year that Porter Wagner asked Dolly to join his show, The Porter Wagner Show. Porter was 19 years Dolly's senior, if you remember, so when Dolly went on his show, she was 21 and Porter was 40. Porter initially brought Dolly on just to sing a duet, but they hit it off so well and the crowd loved it so much but then he brought her on full time and kept inviting her back and by 1969 she was a staple on the porter wagner show sweet country woman you want to help me do a duet <laughs> might as well i'm already here. <laughs> even though you might look at dolly's life and think that her first big break was at 13 years old at the grand Ole opry it's arguably true that her first break was really with Porter Wagner. I mean, her singles did chart, but it was really on the show, the Porter Wagner show, that Dolly gained all of the traction that you see her riding off of today. Dolly would spend the next seven years of her 20s singing on the Porter Wagner show with Porter Wagner. The show almost always featured a duet by Dolly and Porter and some kind of a comedic guest, and then it would always end with some kind of a gospel song. In those seven years that Dolly was singing on the Porter Wagner show, she was going through her entire 20s, from age 21 to 28. Dolly and Porter released 13 albums and had 14 top 10 hits. Porter was also Dolly's producer on a lot of her solo albums. But even though Dolly was singing on this show, she still wanted to be an independent artist. She always wanted that. That was really where her heart was. And Porter actually offered to be the producer on many of her solo albums that she had released in her 20s. Now, when Dolly was about 28 years old, she had released several albums and she knew she wanted to be an independent artist. And she really felt in her heart that staying on the Porter Wagner show longer would hinder her chances to grow in her career. At that time, Dolly had a really tough choice to make. Do I stay on the show with Porter and continue with all of the fame and success that we're having? Or do I take a chance and branch out from the show and really focus on being an independent artist? Ultimately, Dolly decided she needed to break out to be an independent artist. In 1974, Dolly broke the news to Porter that she was going to leave the show. Um, Porter, by the way, did not take this well. He controlled a lot of aspects of her music career when he was producing her solo albums. And I think the idea of Dolly leaving the show was really terrifying to Porter. Now, I think a lot of people tuned into his show to see Dolly Parton. When she came and said that she was leaving, I think Porter kind of had a little bit of a panic, a little panicked moment. He didn't handle it very well. He started going on TV shows and bad-mouthing Dolly. To me, Dolly Parton is the kind of person that I would never trust with anything of mine. I mean her family, her own blood. She would turn her back on to help herself. After several TV shows and interviews where he was just straight up bad-mouthing Dolly, he actually sued her for breach of contract. During all of this turmoil, Dolly was heartbroken. She felt so bittersweet about leaving the show. She knew that it was something she had to do for her career, but she saw 
how hurt Porter was by it and how much pain he was in. It's like that old saying, hurt people hurt people. One reason a lot of people love Dolly Parton is because of this turmoil that happened with Porter. She really came out the bigger person. He was very hurt and mean, attacking her, saying all the things that she was doing poorly and all the things that she had done bad. She never said a bad word about Porter. In fact, when all of this was happening and when he sued her, she wrote Porter a song because that was the best way that she could express to him how she felt. That song was called I Will Always Love You. Now, I think a lot of people who don't know Dolly and don't know her story think that Dolly and Porter were in love. In fact, a lot of people argue that they were because Porter did buy Dolly several gifts, like a new car. You know, he did do her a lot of favors in life, but Dolly was madly in love with Carl Dean. Her relationship with Porter really was just a business relationship that had a lot of, I guess, monetary perks with the cars and everything. You know, maybe Porter had a fascination with Dolly, but don't think anything ever really came of it. And when people hear that Dolly wrote the song, I Will Always Love You, about Porter Wagner, I think a lot of people think that they were in love. They had some sort of a tip and she wrote it. But the truth is she wrote it because she chose to leave the show to become an independent artist. Before Dolly even gave the song to her record company and before they ever released it, before the song ever gained any traction at all, Dolly took it to Porter first. She told him, this song is for you. And of course, I'm gonna give it to the label. It's actually pretty good, but um, I want you to hear it first. So Porter Wagner was the first person to ever hear the song, I Will Always Love You. Initially, after hearing the song, Dolly said that Porter, and Porter admits too, that he was very humbled and honored that she wrote this song about him. And for a while after Dolly wrote him that song, she and Porter had a period of peace and where they had made up and were on good terms. A year later though, the song was released and started doing really, really well. I mean, it was immediately a huge hit. In June of the same year that it was released, it hit number one on the Billboard charts. I Will Always Love You started doing so well that even Elvis Presley approached Dolly Parton and said that he wanted to do a cover of the song. If you haven't seen my video about Elvis Presley's mysterious death, I'll link it up there. Dolly remembers her team calling her and saying, hey, Elvis wants to do a cover of your song. She remembers it like it was yesterday. And she remembers that Elvis's team was saying to her team, you guys just come on down to the studio anytime you want. Elvis will do the cover of I Will Always Love You. We'll take care of everything. Don't worry about it. And Dolly remembers being really, really excited that Elvis Presley was going to cover her song. And then the night before, Dolly and her team were scheduled to go to the studio with Elvis Presley to record the song. Elvis's manager called Dolly and said, by the way, we don't do anything like this unless we get half of the publishing rights. Just a side note. Dolly was heartbroken. She could not give up 50% of the rights of the song, I Will Always Love You. This song was her baby. It's what she had spent her whole career trying to produce was a song like this. It was doing so, so well. If she gave up 50% of the rights to Elvis and his team, it was basically like giving up a child, you know, giving up 50% of your children. She's like, I just cannot do this. But Elvis continued to love that song so much, by the way, that when he and Priscilla went through their divorce, he actually sang that song to Priscilla on the steps of the courthouse. Now, Dolly Parton, during this time frame, released a, another single called Jolene. And Jolene was actually also the name of this album, Side A first song was Jolene. Side B, the first song was I Will Always Love You. Dolly jokes that Jolene actually came from the name of a bank teller who had a huge crush on her husband, Carl Dean. And it actually became a joke between Dolly and Carl because Dolly knew that this bank teller had a huge crush on her husband at the bank. And every time Carl went to the bank, it was like, oh, Jolene is gonna be there. And then Carl started joking that he loved going to the bank because this girl was all over him at the bank. And at one point, Dolly like was joking to her husband and was like, gosh, darn, you're spending a lot of time at the bank. You know, I don't think we have that kind of money. And so out of this very innocent, flirtatious banter between the bank teller and the husband, there came this very like innocent and funny song that is actually people took the song really seriously because a lot of people are in the situation where there is a Jolene. You know, if you're not familiar with the song, it's like Jolene, 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 I'm begging of you, please don't take my man. And it's kind of funny when you hear the song Jolene after knowing the story behind Jolene to know that it was just preposterous and it's just a, just a bank teller. It was super flirty. The song Jolene was about the bank teller, but the bank teller's name was clearly not Jolene. One day Dolly was signing autographs. She was signing an autograph for a little girl. She said, oh, what's your name? And the little girl said, Jolene. And she looked at her and she said, I love the name Jolene. And she said, don't be surprised if I write a song about you named Jolene. Now the album Jolene that had a single Jolene and I will always love you would go platinum a total of three times. 
Now, Porter, meanwhile, is watching all of this success of I Will Always Love You and Jolene, and he is fuming. He's not taking it well. He's getting a little jealous. He doesn't like seeing Dolly being so successful without him. Porter insisted that he was entitled to 15% of Dolly's net income from June 1974 through June 1979, and an additional 15% of her record royalties for all of her songs during those years, and future royal, oh, and future royalties too. That's not all. He also sought an additional $2 million from her for, quote, future loss of income. I mean, this was a brutal and very personal lawsuit. Now, Dolly, when she was hit with this lawsuit, really did not want to go to court. She wanted to settle things with Porter in a good way, not in a courtroom, kind of like Johnny Depp, Team Johnny. So in order to settle things with Porter, rather than meeting all of his requests and the full three million he was requesting, Dolly gave him the first million dollars that she ever made, and they called it a day. Now, after Dolly and Porter settled this lawsuit, albeit outside of a courthouse, Rumors started spreading that the two would be making another duet album together. I guess that was part of the reconciliation was, okay, you'll get the first million that I'll make, and then we'll make a duet album together, and, you know, try to elevate Porter's success a little bit in the coming years. Dolly and Porter did decide to do that, but it just wasn't how you would think that it would have gone. Their duet album ended up being released on August 4th, 1980, but the album wasn't done entirely out of love. Let's put it that way. The album was simply called Porter and Dolly. <laughs> Period. I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, but Dolly and Porter were not on speaking terms when the album got released. And in fact, um, the majority of the album was done with Dolly and Porter in completely separate locations, like not even speaking to each other. And the album cover itself had to be photoshopped, taking a photo of Dolly and a photo of Porter and just putting it together, making it look like they were together when the picture was taken, but they were not. <laughs> just the most awkward duet album ever released, maybe. <laughs> Two singles were released on the album, Dolly and Porter. I mean, Porter and Dolly. Those singles were called, quote, Making Plans, which hit number two on the charts. And If You Go, I'll Follow You, which hit number 12. After the lawsuit with Porter was settled, after Porter had his million dollars and the duet album, Dolly started really taking off in her career and making lots and lots and lots of money, way more than a million, that's for sure. She decided to put a lot of her effort into charity work and not just dumping money into charities. She wanted to be hands-on with the charity, make sure that it was a legit group of people running the charity, and make sure that the charity was actually doing good for actual people, which I think is so impressive about Dolly Parton because so many celebrities will just throw their monies at charities and just say, okay, good, I did something good. But Dolly actually takes these things to heart and makes sure that the charities that she is supporting and creating are sustainable, are authentic, and have integrity. It's amazing. If you ever want to give to a charity, give to a Dolly Parton charity. I'll link all of them in the description below. In 1988, she launched the Dollywood Foundation, which the whole purpose of the Dollywood Foundation was to fund local improvements in her hometown. From that foundation, a buddy program was ultimately formed that offered $500 to high school graduates to help them with book expenses or any other expense that related to graduation. And this ended up decreasing the dropout rate in the high schools in the area from 35% to 6%. Just giving high school students $500 for graduation. And then in 1986, Dolly joined forces with a theme park that had been operating in Knoxville, Tennessee. And she took over a large majority of ownership in this theme park. Part of that meant changing the theme park's name to Dollywood and having her face be, you know, the face of Dollywood. Dollywood theme park. And Dollywood is actually pretty cool. If you haven't been to Dollywood, I kind of recommend going. I'll put the website to Dollywood in the description below. If you've been there, comment below and tell us what you thought. And it wasn't until 11 years later that Kevin Costner's team approached Dolly Parton's team and said that they were making a little movie called The Bodyguard. He wanted to use the song I Will Always Love You in the movie. Dolly said she sent the team the song, I Will Always Love You, to see what they thought, and then she never heard back from them. <laughs> she was kind of like, okay. So she wasn't even sure if they were going to use the song or not, and as Kevin Costner explained, they didn't know if they were going to use the song either. He said that the music production team actually had another song that they were kind of dead set on using, but Kevin Costner loved the song, I Will Always Love You, and he kept pushing the production team to use I Will Always Love You and not to use the song they were planning to use. So Dolly is sitting there thinking, okay, did they get my email? Like I didn't even get a confirmed receipt email back. And meanwhile, Kevin Costner is in Hollywood, you know, just harping on Arista 
Records to use the song I Will Always Love You. The people at Arista Records were working with Whitney Houston and Kevin Costner really wanted to hear Whitney Houston sing the song I Will Always Love You. He just had that he had that feeling. So eventually, after a period of time, Arista Records agrees to have Whitney Houston try out the song, I Will Always Love You. Okay, well, let's just, yeah, Whitney, do you wanna, do you wanna try I Will Always Love You? I Will Always Love You? But Kevin Costner, and Kevin Costner was kind of coaching the people at Arista Records, so he says, I mean, I wasn't there, but he was telling them it has to begin a cappella. It's gotta start out soft, genuine, and quiet. Which, if you think about it, in Whitney Houston's version of I Will Always Love You, that is just what makes it what it is, is the beginning. is so quiet and true and honest because there's no instruments behind it. It's just pure, pure acapella. The people at Arista Records were telling Kevin Costner that that was very silly. And if it started out acapella, it would never be on the radio. And Kevin recalls in several interviews saying to Arista Records, I don't care if it's never on the radio. It has to be acapella in the beginning. That's what shows how much she really digs this guy, is it starts acapella. And so there was kind of this conflict where they didn't want it to be acapella because they wanted it to eventually be on radio. And Kevin Costner was like, I don't care. Nope, it's got to be this way, period. And it's funny because it ends up being like the most popular song on the radio, arguably because it begins a cappella. Meanwhile, Dolly had no idea that they were even gonna use the song. And I guess they had, her team had worked out some sort of, you know, the legal side of things and with the copyright and the licensing and that all got sorted out, but Dolly didn't know. So one day, Dolly is literally just driving her car down Music Row in Nashville, Tennessee, when she hears the song, the Whitney Houston version of the song, I Will Always Love You, come on the radio. And she says, I was just driving and I start hearing this song and she goes, I didn't even recognize the song. And then she realized it was the song, I Will Always Love You. And she said she literally had to pull over the car because she almost had a heart attack. She said, I didn't even know that that song had that kind of potential and then hearing it on the radio and not even knowing that they were even like gonna use it. It's just like, it's hilarious. I mean, it completely, she was floored. And just a few short years after Whitney Houston releases her version of I Will Always Love You, Dolly launches another charity. And this charity was called the Imagination Library and it was founded in 1995. They could enroll their children in the Imagination Library and every month, from the time the child was born until they were five years old, the Imagination Library would send the child a new book. And the whole point of the program was to get children excited to read and to give them things that maybe their parents wouldn't be able to provide to them every single month. It initially launched in Dolly's hometown for struggling families, but eventually spread all over the country. It was soon adopted in North Carolina, District of Columbia, and Ohio. And as of last year, the Imagination Library was responsible for gifting books to over 1.45 million kids. Dolly says that the foundation, the Imagination Library, was inspired by her father, who, if you remember, never learned how to read or write. Recently, more recently, in 2016, Dolly launched another program called My People. My People was founded to directly benefit the people who were affected by the Tennessee wildfires during that year. Also, in the same year that she launched My People, her and Carl Dean celebrated their 50th wedding anniversary. Now, in addition to Dolly's numerous foundations that are enormously successful, Dolly also has donated to numerous causes, including the Vanderbilt University Medical Center, where she donated a million dollars in honor of her niece, who received leukemia treatment there. And in response to the coronavirus pandemic, Dolly Parton donated another million dollars to vaccine research at Vanderbilt, which ultimately went towards the entire development of the Moderna vaccine. At 76 years young, Dolly Parton is still kicking it in Tennessee. She and her husband, Carl, currently live in a 3,000 square foot house in Brentwood. She actually did a tour of her house once and showed that she has a mini chapel in her house and she goes into the mini chapel to pray and to meditate on a regular basis and i thought that was just the sweetest thing in the world it's actually a really nice chapel too it's like an actual church in her house and just last month just a couple months ago dolly was actually traveling the country promoting the imagination library so she is still super active in this organization even at the age of 76. In september of 2022 dolly collaborated with kelly clarkson to release a nine to five remake and in November of 2022, Dolly released a greatest hits collection album called Diamonds and Rhinestones. 
Well, Dolly is first and foremost a woman of faith and attributes all of her success and paths in life to God. She also attributes a lot of her success and well-being to her childhood and growing up and to her father who had the best business sense out of anybody she knows to this day. And Dolly has been very, very smart how she has managed her finances and her investments. She's always remained very humble and made sure to give back as much as she can without putting herself completely out. You know, that's the point is not you put on your oxygen mask before the person next to you. She's always been very good at knowing this is what I need to survive. This is what I need to maintain my well-being. And once I'm there, then I can give to other people. She's just arguably, in my eyes, one of the most humble people in music history and even in the current music industry today. I really hope that you enjoyed watching this video as much as I enjoyed making it. I wish that I could do more. And if you did like the video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. You have no idea how much just one extra thumbs up or subscriber counts to the YouTube algorithm. The more you get in like a certain period of time, the more it moves your videos up in the queue so people can find them. And the less it happens, the more it like pushes down your content and then other people are less likely to see it. So if you like the video and you think other people would enjoy the video, please, please hit the thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. It is just such a huge help. And I will see you on the next video. Hungry for the road all my life. Thirsty for adventure all my youth. Chasing all my freedoms down Liberty Avenue.